Addict of the Wasteland by John Cronshaw 1. The Addict The Addict takes the road east away from the grid. This isn't his usual hunting ground, but pickings are thinning out west. He pulls his tattered cap down over his eyes as he walks into the rising sun, shielding his eyes from the burning glare. There's asphalt beneath his hardened bare feet. He'd sold his boots for plez. He passes dead trees and crawling vines, rusted road signs, and the foundations of long-gone houses poking through the lifeless soil. Blast craters pepper the land to the south. Everything is coated in a brownish-gray dust, probably swept across the wastes during the last storm. He heads towards the greenery. After two miles or so, the road gets steeper. He keeps watch, alert for movement. He grips the handle of his pistol and listens. A dog howls in the distance, too far away to be a threat. The pull of the plez is there. It's always there, nagging him, prodding him. He shudders, removes his cap, runs his hands over his lank hair and beard, and shakes away the withdrawal. The land around him is greener now, wilder. Grasses and mosses stretch across the asphalt, swallowing it, making it part of the land. He reaches the top of the hill, looks down, and puts his cap back on. The sky is clear and the air fresh up here. He sweeps his eyes along the horizon, scanning for a victim. In the east, he catches the glimpse of the dead city, a black smudge of shimmering filth. Nearer, there are cultivated fields and a road leading north to the settlement, Trinity. A river winds through a valley to the south, and there's someone on the road ahead. The attic takes cover behind a tangled thorn bush, watching as the person approaches. The woman is alone and walking with slow, ambling steps. She's wearing a headscarf and has dirty blonde hair. He looks around, knowing it could be a trap, knowing she could be bait for an ambush. She's straining against the weight of a backpack, leaning into each step as she climbs the road towards him. He waits and watches. Her clothes are made from thick wools and leathers. A hunting knife hangs from her belt. He pulls his cap down, obscuring his face. As she reaches the thorn bush, the addict confronts her, pistol in hand. Hold it right there. The woman stops and curses. Don't hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you if you do what I say. He can tell she's not an addict. The woman's eyes are tired and sunken. Okay. Her words come out thin, resigned. First, I need you to toss that knife on the ground. He gestures with the pistol, then step away. He keeps the gun aimed at her, while she unfastens the knife and places it on the ground. She stares up at the addict and steps back. Easy now. Eyes never leaving the woman, he steps forward, leans down, picks up the knife and holds it in his left hand. You alone? The woman hesitates, looking around. No, my man, he's armed. The addict smirks. You're alone. That's good. Please don't hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you. Drop your pack. He gestures with the knife. The woman slides the backpack from her shoulders, places it on the ground in front of her, and shakes her head. Step back. The woman takes three paces back and looks down. Keep going. The woman nods, takes five more paces, and stops. Any plez? No. She folds her arms across her chest. The addict keeps his pistol fixed on her. He kneels opens the top flap of the backpack and drags its contents out. There's a water bottle, five tins of food, a coil of blue rope, a pair of books, socks, a box of matches, and a blanket. He grins, drops his backpack to the ground, takes the books, rope, and matches, and stops. He glances up at the woman, notices the bulge of her belly, and hesitates. You pregnant? The woman gives a quick nod. Damn it. He drops the blanket, bottle tins and socks back into the woman's backpack. I'm taking these things. He pats his backpack. You keep the rest. It's hard out there. She stares at him, confusion etched on her brow. What? Take your stuff. Go, before I change my mind. The woman nods, picks up her backpack and runs west, away from the addict. Damn it. He shakes his head and stares down at his pistol, at his trembling hands, and shudders. He drops the knife into his backpack and lifts it onto his shoulders. He looks back along the road. The woman is still running. He lets out a long, deep sigh, turning his attention back to the road ahead. He can reach Trinity by sunset.
2. Trinity Wheat fields wave against the breeze to the attic's left as the outer fence of Trinity comes into view. Reds and oranges from the setting sun shimmer along the edges of the approaching fence. The fence encloses the settlement in a ramshackle combination of corrugated iron, stones, wood, and sheets of thick plastic and metal. Here and there is a lamppost or a road sign. He recognizes parts of cars. Rope and telegraph wires secure things in place. Away from the fence to the right looms a towering wooden crucifix. Hello, he calls. He looks along the top of the fence and then down at his feet. The road ends where he is standing, but there is no sign of an obvious entrance. He hears the voices of people and the calls of animals from the other side of the fence. He cups his hands around his mouth. Hello? A section of fence slides across with a rumbling scrape. A dark-skinned woman with black dreadlocks leans around the gap and eyes him with suspicion. We don't know you. What do you want? She wears brown robes and holds herself with a raised chin and straight back. I hear you trade, the addict says. I've got some things. What sort of things? The addict gives a half-shrug, scratching his beard. A few books. You armed? Wait here. She closes the fence behind her. He watches her disappear inside and waits. He's aware of the need for plez, the pull, the urge. A cold sweat spreads over his body. A prickling, tingling sensation stretches along his flesh, pulled taut like a snare. A harsh metallic roar erupts as the fence is opened again, this time wider. A tall, skinny man with thin black hair and pale skin stands next to the woman and looks the addict up and down with a scowl. Could you hand over your weapons to Jacob? The woman asks. The addict frowns. We'll return them when you leave. The addict nods, takes his pistol from his jacket and hands it over. He swings his backpack to the ground, retrieves the hunting knife, and hands it to Jacob. Is that everything? Asks Jacob. Yep. That's all I've got. Good. He whispers something to the woman and then leaves. You do this to everyone? The addict asks. Only to people we have no reason to trust. My name's Sal. She extends a hand to the addict. We have a few rules at Trinity. We live by God's law here. We treat others how we'd like to be treated. We do not kill, steal, fornicate, cause harm, or lie. We are a community of friends, but we will not hesitate to banish anyone who goes against our rules. Is that agreeable to you? The addict raises an eyebrow. You're saying I need to keep my nose clean? Sal folds her arms. Precisely. The addict gives a shrug. Okay. Sal leads him into the settlement and closes the fence behind them. The addict stops and looks around with wide eyes. The settlement is nestled in a broad blast crater. He estimates it is a mile from end to end. A man lights torches sticking out from poles and fence posts with a flaming rod. A dirt track leads down a slope to the center. Chickens run by, clucking at his feet. The sound of grunting pigs comes from somewhere to the left. Dilapidated buildings line the edge of the fence, some with glazed windows. Scores of people mill around. A two-story structure towers above to the right. A wire fence houses a pair of cows and a goat. Green leaves sprout from vegetable patches ahead. There's a water tower off to the left, its long shadow stretching across the rooftops of the smaller buildings. What's that weird humming? Sal stops, listening. That will be the bees. We keep them for honey. He sniffs at the air, taking in the aromas of cooking and wood smoke. I'll be damned. What was that? Hell of a place you've got here. We don't like that word. The addict nods. Right. He follows Sal to a single-story wooden building. She opens the door and leads him inside. The building is a single room, gloomy and lined with tables. There's the smell of damp clothes and engine oil. The tables are piled high with goods, arranged in no real order. Next to him is a table littered with bottles, children's toys, sheets of plastic, and a roll of wire. Underneath are a few pairs of boots and shoes. There are car parts, clothing, cutlery, blankets, pots, plates, and items the addict doesn't recognize. Beeswax candles cast an orange glow across the wood-paneled walls. You buy books? The addict asks. We certainly do. 
Sal offers him a short smile. Is there anything in particular you're looking for? He makes a show of looking around the room. Anything I can trade back at the grid, nothing specific. Sal leads him over to an empty table. Please, show me what you've got. The addict swings his backpack onto the table, takes out the books and lays them side by side. Sal examines them, looks up at him and frowns. Where did you get these? And please don't lie to me. From a woman on the road. You stole them, you mean. Her voice is calm, flat. The addict scratches behind his right ear and looks at the ground. You've got to do what you need to if you're going to survive out there. You robbed a pregnant woman. Is she still alive? I didn't hurt her. He opens his hands, meeting her eyes. Honest word. Sal's eyes narrow. You took her goods. Only what's here. I didn't take her food. I didn't take her water. I saw she was pregnant. He shakes his head. That's the truth. If she returns, I will ask her. Right. No deal then. Absolutely not. Right. You'd better give them back to the woman next time she's here. I'll be on my way. The addict goes to leave. Can you get whatever his name was to return my pistol? He pulls on his backpack, walks over to the door. Wait, says Sal. The wastes are too dangerous to wander alone. He stops, looks back at Sal, and tilts his head in confusion. I'll have Jacob prepare a room for the night. You do that? He asks, raising his eyebrows. Sal nods. Of course. You've shown willingness to change your ways. You had a choice to walk away, to trade those books elsewhere, but you didn't. You may live your life with sin, but there can be salvation. The attic doesn't say anything. Are you hungry? She asks. Yep. Aren't we all? Sal leads the way across the settlement to a large wooden building. This is our communal hall. We all eat together here. Sal shuts away the darkness when they step inside to the warmth and noise. Three long pine tables and six benches fill the room. Men, women, and children sit in rows, eating soft breads, boiled potatoes, and roasted meats. A tray piled with boiled eggs is passed along the first table. There's a seat over there, she says, pointing to the far end of the center table. Smiling, the addict takes a seat. A tin plate makes its way down the table towards him and then a second plate when Sal takes her seat next to him. He looks up and recognizes Jacob. Jacob, isn't it? Jacob nods, looking at Sal. She gets to her feet and scans her eyes across the other residents' faces. Let us pray. Confused, the addict looks around and sees the others dipping their heads and clasping their hands together. He copies the gesture. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for this meal and for the protection you provide us. Please give us the strength to help those who need helping and to keep us safe in these final days. Amen. Sal returns to her seat. The addict feels a nudge against his side and raises his head. You can stop praying now, Sal whispers. Oh right, thanks. He lets Sal fill his plate with bread, roasted chicken, and potatoes. A woman to his right passes him a clay cup. A carafe of water is passed down the table. This is an amazing place, he says, looking around. Nothing like the grid. Jacob scoffs. Such a terrible, unholy place. The grid? The addict shrugs one shoulder. It's all right. Jacob tilts his head and regards the addict for several seconds. You don't look all right. Your skin's practically hanging off you. You've got bruised eye sockets. You're pale and sweating. Sal places a hand on Jacob's and shakes her head. Don't, she whispers. You know how I feel about letting Plez heads in here, Jacob says, pulling his hand away. We are all God's children, Jacob. Jacob shakes his head. You're right, I apologize. It is Plez, isn't it? Sal asks. Of course it is, Jacob snaps. Look at him. Sal shoots a glare at Jacob before turning back to the addict. Am I right? The addict scratches his beard, takes a piece of bread in his mouth, chews and swallows. Yep, you can't get off it, what can you do? That's not true, says Sal. If you're willing, you can be free with faith. Faith? He rolls his eyes. What's faith? You think God's going to help me off Plez? He lets out a bitter laugh. Look around us. Look at the world. If God existed, God died a long time ago. I respect what you do here, 
I really do. You seem to have got it figured out. Please don't start talking to me about God, about some guy in the clouds looking out for us. No one's ever looked out for me. He tears a piece of chicken from the bone. We can look out for you, says Sal. The addict stops, the chicken raised halfway to his lips. You can change. And what if I don't want to change, the addict asks, placing the chicken back down on his plate. Your decisions aren't your own. You're led by Plez to steal, to lie. But even when you do steal, you show compassion. You can live a good life. The addict waves a dismissive hand. I'm not interested in this God stuff. It's not about God. It's about doing right. Sal meets his gaze. You know what doing right is. I've seen it. The addict doesn't respond, grabs the piece of chicken from his plate and eats. Sal leans forward, touching the addict's left hand. You can be free. She looks up at him. You can focus on finding something good. There's no good in this world. Exhausted, the addict lies back on a soft bed. He pulls the woolen blanket over him and sighs. To his left, there's a bedside table. At the end of the bed, his backpack leans against a wooden chair. A slight draft comes through a broken join in the wood paneling along the left-hand wall, next to the door. Wind whistles through the gap, making the flame of the beeswax candle on the bedside table flicker and dance, casting rippling shadows along the wall. He closes his eyes, basking in the comfort for several minutes before his mind shifts and fixates on Plez. A cold sweat shrouds him and his teeth chatter. His head thunders with pain. Desperate, he leans over the end of the bed and rifles through his backpack with frantic, trembling fingers. Deep inside, he finds his pipe and a crystal of Plez. He lets out a sharp breath of relief. He sits up, drapes the blanket over his crossed legs, and picks up the pipe. Taking the pipe in his mouth, he pushes the plez into the blackened end, moves it to the flame at the top of the candle, and inhales. Crackles of pleasure fizz through his body. He gasps for air as he descends into bliss for a moment. There's a sharp stabbing pain in his chest. He falls to his side, topples over the edge of the bed, and hits his head against the floorboards with a sharp smack, falling unconscious. 3. Withdrawal Vomit erupts from the addict's mouth when he wakes. He tries to move, tries to call out, but he is paralyzed, screaming from within. He's aware of voices around him and glimpses of movement, of shadows and colors through fog. Floods of fire and ice and electricity pulse through his body. His arms and legs convulse uncontrollably. There are faces, mutterings, and swirls of confusion. He thinks he recognizes Jacob and Sal. He calls out, but he's trapped deep beneath a layer of gel, squirming like a mosquito as the amber sets around him. His body drifts along as though the hands of a crowd lift him, bouncing and whirling as he loses grip with his senses. The air changes. The smells are different. When the addict wakes again, he can move his tongue. His mouth is sore, and his spit is as thick as mud. There's a taste of iron and rust, of blood and bile. He leans to his right and pushes the filth from his mouth, letting it dribble onto the bed next to him. He's vaguely aware of Sal's face, her dreadlocks like snakes. He's not afraid. He does not recoil. Can you hear me? She asks. Her voice is distant, echoic, muffled, as though heard through water. Comprehending, the attic nods and tries to speak. His tongue is swollen and bleeding. She calls out to Jacob. The attic lies back. Something damp presses against his forehead. He drifts in and out of awareness. He opens his eyes at the end of a nightmare. Sal is still there. Are you okay? She whispers. Her voice is sharp and clear. I, he splutters, must have been bad cook. His eyes are encrusted with gum. He rubs them with the heels of his hands. There's a burst of pain as a yawn tears through his throat and scrapes against his lungs. Sal shakes her head. There's no such thing as good plez. The room is different. A desk stands to his right, and books stand on shelves above. Where am I? Jacob's surgery. We thought you were going to die. Jacob thinks you had a bad reaction. The addict flops back, his strength and energy sapped. Can I have a drink? 
Sal holds a cup of water against his lips. The addict sips. Thanks, he says. I couldn't move. I know. He feels Sal's hand on his arm. The smell of rubbing alcohol hangs in the air. How long was I out? Two days. God still has a plan for you in this world. The addict spits, part out of protest. Where's God? He turns away. I was lucky. You're going to end up like every other addict. What's to live for? He meets Sal's pitying eyes with a defiant glare. Sal shrugs. God. That's not an answer. It's the only answer. The addict shakes his head and sniffs. We can help you, Sal says. We can get you off Plez. You can live again. What if I don't want to? Then you'll die, and next time Jacob won't be around to help you. It's that simple. The addict opens his mouth to speak, closes it, and shakes his head. No one gets off Plez, he says with bitter resignation. Perhaps. Sal pushes out her bottom lip. Perhaps not. It will be much easier to do if you're willing to accept help. He shuffles towards the head of the bed, sits up, and looks at Sal. How? With God's love, we can... Pa! The addict waves a hand. Is that all you've got? Give me something else. Something real. But God is... Something else, he snaps. Sal nods. You can't avoid God's love. But if you need something else, think about something you love. The addict considers this sighing. All I've known for so long is Plez. All I think about is getting it, and then I'm on it, and then I want it again. It's always there. That's all I've got. Sal makes a grim smile. I know. She whispers. Think back. Think back to before the Plez. What did you like? I was a kid. I'd play, I'd make things, I'd read. My mum used to have these books from before. Stories about dragons and magic. About rockets that went through the sky. I miss that. Can you still read? The addict furrows his brow. I couldn't say. It's been so long. We've got lots of books here. Stories from before the end times. You can read them. You can stay here. We can help you. The addict smiles. No God stuff? It's all God stuff, but I'll try not to preach to you. All I ask in return is that you live by our rules and attend sermons on Sundays. The addict wrinkles his nose. What do you mean? We meet as a community once a week to hear a lesson from the Bible. You don't have to believe in God, but the lessons are useful for us all to live better lives. And you'll help me? No offense, but I'm waiting for the catch. The catch is that you free yourself from plez, that you live your life doing right. Sal rises to her feet. I won't ask for an answer now. You're tired, and you've been through a lot. Please think about my offer. Will do. 4. Hope When Sal returns a few hours later, she's carrying a tray of food. There's a bread roll, a leg of chicken, and a pile of steaming mashed potato. Hungry? She asks. She slides the tray onto the bed next to the addict. I can eat. Thanks, Sal. He leans over, taking the chicken leg with his left hand. His movement is weak, but he manages to lift the meat to his mouth and take a bite. You've no idea how good this tastes. He wipes his mouth with his sleeve, looks down at his clothes and realizes they're not his own. Where are my clothes? They've been washed and are waiting for you in your room. Right. Thanks. Sal sits down on the seat next to him. Have you thought about what we were talking about before? She asks. Yep. And? He gives a sigh, scratches his beard, and looks down at the food. I keep thinking there's a catch. I keep thinking this is too good to be true. When you live at the grid, you know everyone's got an angle. Everyone's looking to get something from you. I've already explained the catch. No more plez. Do right. It's that simple. It's not simple. It is, she says flatly. If you swear to stop taking plez and do all you can to do right, you will have our friendship. We look out for each other here. Love is the most precious thing we can all give. And what if I mess up? What if I can't help myself? The corner of Sal's mouth twitches. It won't come to that. She shakes her head. You need to start holding on to hope. But what if it does? He turns to Sal, meeting her gaze. Hope springs eternal, with help and love. She takes in a deep breath. 
I won't let that happen. The addict sighs. Have you seen an addict twitching? Have you ever seen a guy scratch his own eyes out because he can't get plus? Sal remains silent, looking down at her hands. I have. The addict folds his arms. I don't want to be that guy. There are also the addicts who die every day from a dangerous batch, or because their bodies just give up. It seems to me either choice is fraught with risk, but one of them leads you to a path of living a good life, and the other does not. He considers Sal's words, tasting the creamy potato he holds in his mouth and swallows. Okay, I'll do it. 5. The Fence Candles flicker. A fire burns in the corner, throwing a warm orange glow across the attic's face. Books line shelves along the walls, and sunlight pours in at a steep angle through a glazed window. The sound of clucking chickens and children's laughter seeps into the walls. The attic leans forward on the bench, looks to Sal and smiles. He turns back to his book spread open on the desk before him, squinting as he focuses on the words. Do you think you can still read? Sal asks. A little. It's coming back to me. I can remember the letters on their own, but I'm struggling with the sounds when they're together. He points to a word with a grubby finger. What's that say? Ishmael. What's an Ishmael? It's a name. He looks at the words and nods. Call. Me. Ishmael. Sal nods. That's right. Keep going. So. He narrows his eyes, looking to Sal. Some. Right. He turns back to the page. Some. Years. Ago. Never each a mind. How long. Pre. Prick. Damn it. He slams the book shut, leans back, looks up at the ceiling, and rubs his beard. I can't do this. You can. She places a hand on the attic's arm. The word is precisely. Agitated, the attic gets to his feet, takes off his cap, and runs his fingers through his hair. His eyes wander half-focused around the room. I'm twitching, Sal. I can't do this. You're doing great. Sal's voice is calm, patient, reassuring. The addict paces back and forth. Sweat gathers around the back of his neck and slicks his forehead. Floorboards creak beneath his feet with each step. He takes a deep breath, holds it, and lets out a sigh. His hands tremble. I can't do this. Try to sit back down. She pats the chair and smiles. You think I can sit still. You think I can concentrate. All that's going through my head is plez, plez, plez. I need to get some. Just to get me by. No. Her voice is firm. You'll only be going back. You've got to keep hope in your heart. Hope? That's nothing. That's like your god. Sal raises her chin, pursing her lips. Please sit down. With tears filling his eyes, the addict sits. He drops his head into his hands and sobs. Sal's arm moves around his back. She comforts him. I can't do it. He grabs a fistful of hair. I can't do it. You can, Sal whispers. You'll get through this. The addict's skin is cold and clammy when he's led by Sal into the communal hall. Sal walks at his side, holds him by the arm, steadying him as he wobbles forward. He pushes himself with each step as if wading through mud. Each breath brings a jolt of pain to his chest as thick phlegm fills his mouth and clogs his nose. He barely registers the faces staring at him as Sal leads him to a seat. Dazed, the addict gives a half-smile when he realizes a plate piled with potatoes, carrots, and fried pork has been served to him. His head sways as he struggles to focus on Sal. Thanks, he manages. He blinks at the food for several minutes while the rest of the room falls into a strange blur. Sounds undulate and twist. Something presses against his lips. He looks down. Sal is feeding him. The food is pushed into his mouth. He chews slowly, languidly. He's not hungry. With effort, he pushes the food out of his mouth, letting it cascade down his beard. Plez, he whispers. A panic rushes through him, desperate, urgent. Jacob is saying something to him, but his words are far away, as if heard through glass. His face distorts and contorts into garish, horrific smiles. The addict starts to cry squeezes his eyes shut, curls into a ball and falls to the floor, convulsing. It's the middle of the night when the addict shoots up from his sleep with a sudden jerk. He sits upright, itching all over. He's in his room. There's no sign of Sal, no sign of Jacob. 
His clothes are on the bedside table. He pulls on his trousers and jumper. The floor is cold beneath his feet. Twitching, he steps over to the door and opens it. There's a rush of cold night air. Chickens cluck in their coops as the stars twinkle above. There's the smell of pig feces, wood smoke, and animal feed. Moonlight glistens along the top of the fence, catching bits of metal with a silvery white glow. Thin wisps of smoke rise from the surrounding shacks, leaning with the wind and climbing into the night. He walks downhill towards the center of the blast crater. A cow looks up at him with sleepy eyes. He walks over, pats the cow's head, its ears twitch, the addict sighs, wandering past the chicken sheds, the vegetable patches, and uphill towards the communal hall. Only the animals make a sound. Walking along the fence, he gropes for an exit. He passes beneath extinguished torches and runs his hand along the twists of rope and wire. He slides his back down a smooth sheet of metal and sits with his head between his knees. His fingernails draw blood from his clenched fists. He squeezes harder, trying to feel something that isn't the pain of withdrawal. Icy sweat coats his skin as throbbing bolts of pain ricochet around his skull. Damn it, he whispers. He strikes the ground with his fists. Frustrated, he tugs at his beard tearing out handfuls of hair, then letting them drift to the ground in clumps. He arches forward and cries out. Tears sting his eyes as they wash down his face. The taste of blood fills his mouth. He rolls onto his side and vomits. I can't do this, I can't do this. A hand rests on his shoulder. He looks up. Sal. 6. The Fall The addict takes slow, deliberate breaths. He looks down at the page, furrowing his brow. I can't do this, Sal. I'm spent. Sal folds her arms and gives an admonishing glare. Try to focus. I can't focus, damn it. The addict looks down at the dried cuts and half-formed scabs on his palms, shaking his head. You said you'd get me off this stuff. We are. Sal places a hand on his left arm. You are going to get through this. I know it's tough. He jerks his arm free and turns to Sal with anger. You've no idea how tough it is. No one gets off Plez. He slumps over the desk, burying his head in his arms. I'm beyond help. Sal's hand is back on his shoulder. What? He snaps. How do you feel? The addict sits up and gestures to his hands. Look at me. I stink. I'm sweating. He holds his trembling hands up in front of Sal's face. See that? That's the shakes, the twitches you get when your body's crying out for Plez. It's all I can think about. He tugs at his beard, giving Sal a haunted look. But you must feel better than you did, surely. I'm not unconscious, if that's what you're getting at. Sal smiles. Things will get better. Jacob said the plez just takes a while to work its way out. He sighs and wrings his wrists. I know. I know. Sal jabs at the book and smiles again. Go ahead. Call me Ishmael, some years ago. He looks up and sees Sal smiling and nodding for him to continue. Some years ago, never mind how long, precisely. That's it, Sal whispers, having little or no money in my purse and nothing in par, partic. He coughs. Globs of blood and phlegm burst from his mouth. A convulsive, uncontrollable fit rushes along his body in wave after wave. He drops to the floor shaking, sobbing. He coughs again and vomits. Sal runs to the door. She calls out. The addict's vision fades to nothing. Hushed voices whisper around him when the addict stirs. He forces his eyelids open. Looking around, he realizes he's back in Jacob's surgery. His mouth is dry, and he wheezes out each pained breath. Water. He looks up at Jacob and Sal. They watch him their faces etched with concern. He sips the cool water when Jacob leans over him and hands him a pewter cup. What happened? He asks. Try to take it easy, Jacob says. You had a bit of a fall. The addict raises a hand to the right side of his head and cringes at the sharp spike of pain. An egg-sized bump protrudes from his skull. He grimaces. How? He takes another sip of water. You had a fit from the withdrawal. You're lucky Sal was with you. 
Damn it, the attic says. I just want to be over this. Jacob wipes the attic's brow with a cold, damp cloth. You're nearly there. You don't look as yellow as you did, and your eyes are starting to look normal. I don't feel normal. You will. Jacob offers him a shrug. I need to do something. I can't just wait about. What needs doing around here? He reaches for the cup, takes another sip of water, and sits up with his head leaning against the wall. Do you know about animals? Cows, chickens, pigs? The addict shakes his head. No, they don't have anything like that at the grid. Jacob nods. Okay. He looks around. How about toiling in the fields? You know about growing crops? No, I'd be willing to learn. Jacob purses his lips and taps his chin for several moments. You could always clean dishes. I could do that. At least it will give me something to distract me. If you think I'm over the worst. Jacob nods. I'm not sure if you are over the worst yet, but I'm sure you're closer to it being out of your system than not. Resigned. The addict gives Jacob a blank look. Right. 7. Cleaning. The addict throws a handful of dust onto another tin plate and rinses it away with water heated by the fire. He adds the plate to the pile to his left. Men and women work around him, preparing food for the evening meal. A vat of stew bubbles on a stove behind him. He salivates at the aroma of simmering beef stock. Pots and pans clatter. He takes another plate and another handful of dust. A hand touches his shoulder. How are you feeling? Asks Sal. Oh, hey, Sal. He puts the plate down and gives a half smile. I'm okay. Still getting the twitches, still getting the urges, but I'm feeling in control. You're starting to look better. You don't have that pallid look anymore. That's good to know. It's that hope thing you were talking about. I know I can do this. Sal gives the addict a smile, nods to herself, and takes his hands. I'm really proud of you. You are really starting to turn things around here. Thanks, Sal. The addict hums to himself when he makes his way back to his room. The last glimmers of sunlight drift beyond the horizon. He turns the handle, shoulders his way through the door, closes it behind him, and flops down on the bed. Through the fading light, he looks to his bedside table and sees Sal has left him a copy of Moby Dick. There's an unlit candle next to the book. He sits up, crawls to the end of his bed, reaches into his backpack, and searches inside for some matches. His fingers touch against the side of a matchbox. He grips it, and there's something else. A tiny crystal, the size of the end of his little finger. He is paralyzed for a moment as if frozen in time. He grabs the crystal and the matchbox, placing them down on the bedside table to his left. There is an incandescent burst of light when the addict strikes a match. With trembling fingers, he lights the beeswax candle and extinguishes the match with a flick of his wrist. He crawls back to the end of the bed and reaches into his backpack for his pipe. He holds the pipe in his hands, cold against his skin. His thoughts are being pulled and stretched in two directions, the clash of shame and desire. He stuffs the crystal into the pipe and holds it against the candle flame. A sudden jolt hits the back of his brain like a surge of electricity. His nerve endings smolder as arcs of bliss and pleasure engulf him. His heart races, his breath deepens, sweat oozes from his pores. He slumps, descends, descends. 8. Relapse The addict sits bolt upright in his bed. His sheets are drenched with sweat and urine. Thin streams slice through the gloom, reflecting on the surface of the pipe. Leaning, he picks the pipe up and looks down at it for a long time, ashamed. He shakes his head as tears run down his cheeks. Damn it. He gets to his feet with weak, awkward motions, stepping over to his backpack. He drops the pipe in and sighs. Squinting, he opens the door to his room and looks out over the settlement. The sun shines with an oppressive ferocity. He shields his eyes from the glare with a forearm. Bad night, comes a male voice. Startled, he jerks to the right and sees Jacob. He clears his throat, hoarse and dry. Yep, bad night. Jacob tilts his head, regards the addict, and examines him. You sure it was just a bad night? The addict looks down and kicks a stone at his feet. Just withdrawal. You know how it is. You've got your color back. 
The addict shakes his head. What you mean? Stop this, Jacob spits. The bruising is back around your eyes. There's no response. The addict scratches at the back of his neck and looks back down at his feet. I'm sorry, he mutters. I messed up. I need to tell Sal about this, Jacob says, walking away. No, wait. The addict chases after him, grabbing his shoulder. Please, it was a mistake. I don't know what happened. Jacob meets the addict's eyes and spits on the ground to his right. All I know is that you took Plez within our community and tried to lie about it. The addict drops to his knees and holds up his hands, his eyes growing wide. You need to help me, please. Jacob shakes his head and walks away. Back in his room, the addict is packing his things. He fastens his backpack and pulls on his jacket. He sits at the edge of the bed, reaches into his jacket pocket, feels for his pistol, and remembers it's not there. He curses. There's a knock at the door. Yep. The door creaks open. Sal steps inside. Why? The addict looks down at his hands. I don't know. I'm so angry. You lied. I don't know what happened. I was going to read, but then there was a crystal in my pack and... and... and you took it. I couldn't help myself. I really couldn't. Did you try? Did you call out? I could have helped you, but instead... Sal shakes her head and raises a hand in frustration. It wasn't like that. The addict gets to his feet. He paces and tries to meet Sal's eyes. You've got to believe me, Sal. It just happened. I didn't plan it. I was weak. You were, she agrees, placing a hand on her hip. You've no idea how much shame and guilt I feel about this. You've got to believe me. I'm so sorry. Sal nods. I know you are, she whispers. Tears well up in her eyes. You agreed on the rules when we took you in. You lied to Jacob. What are you saying? You saying I need to go? I'm sorry. Give me another chance. I promise I won't mess up. It's not just about me. We have rules in our community for a reason. I'm sorry, but we're going to have to ask you to find somewhere else. The addict slumps down onto the bed, puts his head in his hands, and sobs. You've been so good to me, he says turning to Sal. I always mess things up. 9. The Grid The air is thick with the smell of burning plastic and the open sewerage ditch that runs along the road towards the grid. Fires burn in metal barrels sending sparks into the night sky, twirling and eddying as they dance around plumes of billowy black smoke. Dealers huddle around a bonfire next to the trailer of a strip bit and rusted truck. Another swings a large Michigan absent arcs and leans against the side of a camper van. They all have rifles. The addict weaves through the rows of cars. Some are burnt out, blackened shells of twisted metal. Men and women lie dazed on the car seats. Tiny sparks of flame, like campfires in a dark forest, mark the smoking of Plez. He trips against a teenage boy, curled in a stupor against the back wheel of a sunken pickup truck. He steps over to his usual car and looks in the window. There's a man taking advantage of a half-dressed woman, pawing at her exposed breasts as a string of vomit descends from her mouth. Damn it. The addict bangs his fist on the roof of the car. His regular dealer approaches, rifle slung over her right shoulder. Her face is hard and scarred. Not seen you around for a while. Her voice comes out as a dry croak. I've been on the roads. Yeah? Got anything you want to trade? Nope. We got a fresh batch of Plez. Good stuff from out west. Anything like the last batch? He asks, eyes narrowing. The woman shakes her head. That was a bad cook. Uh, here, if you got nothing to trade, you can try this. She places a single purple crystal into the addict's hand before he can refuse. Just remember where I am when you're looking to trade. Right, he says with a frown. Don't look like that, trust me. This new stuff is great. Best yet. The addict nods and pockets the crystal. Looking around for a place to sleep, he wanders around the grid for another half hour, gets back on the road and leaves. He follows the line of asphalt, making his way back east. He thinks about Sal and Jacob, about the life he could have had, about the life he gave up, the life he lost. There's the sound of feral dogs hunting in the distance, their howls echoing across the night. He shivers against the cold as icy prickles of sweat seep through his flesh. 
The branches of dead pines snap beneath his feet. He stops, leans down, gathers the branches, and takes them in a bundle down a bank towards a copse of trees. He arranges the branches in a pile and lights a fire. He removes his backpack and places it on the ground. He leans with his head back against a tree and drapes his jacket over his knees like a blanket. The cold stings his tears. With aching joints, he reaches into his backpack and takes out his pipe. He feels its weight in his hands, the cold wind against his fingers. No more. He pockets the pipe in his jacket and takes out his pistol. Without looking, he opens the chamber, removes the bullet and blows on it. He returns the bullet, listening to the usual click. Thoughts of Sal and Jacob fill his mind again. He wonders if he can make things right. The campfire is nothing but cold white ash when the addict awakens. He lies on his side, his head resting on his arm. A rabbit sniffs around the fire, then looks up, meeting eyes with the addict. They stare at each other for a long moment. He pushes himself up, leans with his head against the tree, and watches as the rabbit darts away, zigzagging through the undergrowth. Shaking away the numbness in his arm, he looks around, feeling the need for plez. With a groan, he forces himself to get to his feet. He brushes soil and leaves from his clothes and skin and reaches into his backpack. Groping around, he retrieves a water bottle. The bottle is light, almost empty. He unscrews the cap and takes a sip. There's a foul metallic taste. He spits the water out. Damn it. He wipes his mouth with his sleeve screws the cap back on, drops the bottle into his backpack, and heaves the backpack onto his shoulders. He looks up the embankment towards the road. The pang of hunger pulls at his stomach. He curses when he realizes he has no food. Weak and sore, he sets off onto the road, heading east. He passes the skeletons of ancient buildings, their foundations standing like grim memorials to the time before. Tiny explosions of dust creep into the air whenever he knocks against a vine or branch. He grows alert as the road gets steeper. He checks for his pistol, for his hunting knife, and shakes away the thoughts of Plez. He smiles when the land becomes greener, when the dust, craters, and bare earth make way for thick trees and bushes. There's an apple tree to his right. He approaches it and twists an apple hanging ripe from a low branch. He brushes away a coating of dust by rubbing the apple against his trousers. He takes a bite, smiles at the spray of bittersweet juice in his mouth, and revels at the crunching sound as he chews. The sky has a brown tinge to it when the addict reaches the top of the hill. His leather coat flaps against the wind, and he squints against the swirls of dust. Dropping to one knee, he removes his backpack, takes a kerchief from a side pocket, and ties it around his head covering his mouth and nose. He gets up, pulls on his backpack, and looks east towards the city, the black shimmering smear hazy through the approaching dust storm. He looks back towards the grid, only visible as thin trails of rising black smoke. Turning back to the road, he marches forward, ambles downhill, all the while shielding his face from the thickening dust cloud. After an hour, he sits with his eyes closed as the winds tear against his skin. He leans with his back against a tree, listening to the branches creaking and rattling above. His breath is warm against his kerchief. Dust drops from his beard and jacket in clumps, or otherwise clings to his sweat coating him in grime. He coughs. His lungs burn and his throat is raw. Above, the branches crash against each other, protesting against the wind. He opens his left eye, follows the line of the asphalt, closes it to a narrow slit, and gets to his feet. With pained steps, he pushes against the wind. He grimaces at the peeling flesh on his hands, the skin along his fingers bright pink and cracked. He dips his head and holds his left forearm in front of his eyes, trying in vain to shield himself. Damn it, he grunts. He takes a trail to his left and stumbles towards Trinity. Dust settles like snowdrifts along the east side of the fence when he arrives. With clenched fists, he bangs at the sliding gate. Sal, he calls. Jacob, he beats on the fence again, waits for a minute, and tries again. The sound of his voice being drowned out by the rattling of metal, the creaking of wood, and the whistling of the swirling storm. When no answer comes, he walks along the fence, looking for another way in. But there is nothing. On the west side, he realizes he's sheltered from the wind. He slides with his back down a sheet of thick plastic, sits leaning against the fence, and waits. The sun is setting by the time the storm abates. Dense purple clouds circle across the sky, 
as thin wisps of wood smoke drift over the sides of the fence. The addict unties the kerchief from his face, shakes away the dust, folds it, and puts it in his backpack. He gets to his feet and stretches. The nagging pain of Ple's withdrawal tugs at him, nudges him, assaults him. He coughs, walks back around to the entrance, and bangs on the gate. He leans backwards and cups his mouth. Sal, he calls. He knocks again and then steps back as the gate slides open. Sal leans around the gate with a confused expression. What happened? She asks. She's wearing a black woolen robe, its hood pulled tight around her head. The addict looks down. His clothes are filthy, and his feet and hands are bloody. I got caught in the storm. You were out in that? She whispers, eyes widening. She looks behind her, hesitates, looks the addict up and down, and then steps aside. Come in. Come. 10. The Offering Sal leads the addict back to his room. When they go inside, the bed has been stripped. There's a coating of brownish-gray dust on everything. I need to give you my weapons. He hands Sal the hunting knife and pistol. She takes them, placing them next to her on the bare mattress. I think I should give you this as well. He reaches into his jacket and takes out his pipe. I should have given you this before. I held on to it. I don't know why. He pauses. I owe you. You don't owe us anything. We're just treating you like any other trader. You can eat with us, stay overnight, but then you need to go. I need you to take it from me. I need to be free. He drops the pipe in Sal's hand. She nods but doesn't say anything. He reaches into his jacket. And there's this. He takes the plez from his pocket. I want you to take it away. Sal shakes her head. You need to destroy it yourself. You need to prove that you really want to be saved. I do, Sal. I really do. Sal nods, gets up and pockets the pistol, knife, and pipe. Bring it outside. He nods, leans his backpack against the wall, and follows Sal outside into the moonlit night. Torches flicker like fireflies when the addict looks across the settlement. He follows Sal along a worn-out path, past the chicken coops. They head to an unfamiliar building, no more than a shed. Wait here. He waits, rocking on the balls of his feet. There's the sound of movement coming from inside, the sound of things being opened and slammed shut, then of something heavy being dragged along a wooden floor. Sal exits the shed, back first. She's dragging a flat round stone, two feet in diameter. He helps her and pushes it to the path. Where do you want it? He asks. Here's fine. Sal steps back inside the shed and emerges a few seconds later with a hammer hanging down from her right hand. Do you think you can do it? She asks. Shadows cast from a nearby torch send ripples of orange light across her face. Her eyes are intense, quizzing. Confused, the addict furrows his brow, scratches his beard, and looks at the hammer. I don't understand. Are you telling me the truth? Asks Sal. Is that Plez the last of it? There's nothing else? He inhales sharply and takes the crystal out of his pocket. Yep. He feels the pull of the drug, tempting him, seducing him. He steals himself. This is it. He lets out a sharp breath. I need to do this. Sal hands him the hammer. Destroy it. Put it on that stone and destroy it. I... Okay. Shaking, he places the crystal in the center of the stone. He raises the hammer, swings it down in a slow arc, tests its trajectory and raises it again. He closes his eyes, takes in a deep breath, and looks at Sal. I'm not going to make you do anything you aren't ready to do. This needs to be your... Before Sal can finish her words, he brings the hammer down with a deep crack. The purple crystal lies shattered like glass on the stone. The addict's breath is deep. A rush of adrenaline spreads over him, and there's something else, a sensation of happiness, of freedom. He drops the hammer to his side, falls to his knees, and cries. Well done, Sal whispers. That must have been hard for you. He feels her hand on his shoulder, warm and comforting. He looks up at her and smiles. Thank you, please forgive me. Sal nods. We'll talk over breakfast. Let's take you to your room, get you cleaned up. 
Thanks, Sal. He gets to his feet, walks away from the shattered Plez crystal, and does not look back. The addict has no appetite when he enters the communal hall the next morning. His eyes are gummy, and his thoughts cloudy as he takes his seat. Sal told me you were back. Jacob doesn't look up from his plate. You're very lucky. This is just a one-night thing, says the addict. I just wanted Sal to know that I was serious about getting off Plez. Jacob gives an almost imperceptible nod and takes a slice of bread from a tray making its way along the table. The addict sees Sal heading his way. She is wearing a brown robe, her dreadlocks sway as she walks. Did you sleep okay? She asks. Not really. But I appreciate the bed. Appreciate the hospitality. Everything. Has Jacob spoken to you yet? Sal takes a seat at the head of the table. A little. He hands Sal a tin plate, takes a slice of bread and puts it to his mouth. So what do you say? He lowers the bread and tilts his head. About what? We were thinking of giving you a second chance. We acted hastily in dismissing you the way we did. But you've shown that you are committed to freeing yourself from this horrible, horrible drug. Right. What if things get bad again? What if I hit that low point again? What will you take if you do? You destroyed the last of your plez. Good point. He smiles to himself. Jacob raises his eyes, looking at the addict. We will help you in any way we can. The addict shakes his head. I don't know what to say. Thank you. 11. Recovery A month passes and the addict is clean. He is packing his backpack when there's a knock at the door. Yep. You know you don't have to leave yet, says Sal. I do. You guys have been too good to me. You've already done more than anyone could have asked. Don't go back to the grid. He shakes his head and offers a grim smile. If I can help it, I never want to go back to the place again. Good, she whispers. What will you do? Head east. He offers her a half shrug. Follow the road. See if I can get to the city. That's an unholy place. Perhaps. But you never know. There might be good things in those old buildings. There might be books. Knowledge from before. That reminds me. She reaches into her robe, taking out a battered paperback. I want you to have this. He reaches out, takes the book, and smiles. Moby Dick. He examines the cover, taking in the faded images of a boat and a white whale. Thanks, Sal. He leans forward, hugs her, and kisses her cheek. This means a lot. He slides the book into his backpack and lifts the backpack onto his shoulders. There's another knock at the door. Come in, Sal says. Jacob steps inside. How are you feeling? Good, I'm ready to go. Jacob nods, and they follow the attic to the entrance. Sal slides the fence across. If you find any good books, remember us. We are always looking to trade. Thanks, Sal. He turns to Jacob, extending a hand. Couldn't have done it without you. If it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for both of you, I would still be twitching, still be just another addict. Jacob smiles but does not respond. The addict steps through the fence, looking at Sal and Jacob. I'm able, by the way. He rubs the back of his neck. I never properly introduced myself before. Sal touches his left arm and smiles. Thank you. Abel nods and heads along the trail towards the highway. He turns back after a minute, returns Sal's wave and moves on. After an hour on the road, there is a movement from the bushes to his right. He freezes, watches, and waits. A brindle-haired dog bounds out, runs in circles around Abel, drops to its belly, looks up, and whines. Hey, he laughs. What you doing? The dog gets up and rolls on its back at Abel's feet. He crouches and strokes its tummy. The dog jumps up, licks Abel's face, makes a circle, and rolls on its back again. Abel looks around for other dogs, but there are none. You coming with me? He asks, getting to his feet. The dog circles him and makes a cheery yap. Come on, girl, he says. Let's go. The End Thanks for listening. Subscribe now so you don't miss out on future stories. Addict of the Wasteland is a prequel story to John Cronshaw's Wasteland series. The first book, Wizard of the Wasteland, is available now. Visit johncronshaw.com 
slash books to find out more. Addict of the Wasteland is copyright 2016 by John Cronshaw. All rights reserved. This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, businesses, places, events, locales, and incidents are either the products of the author's imagination or used in a fictitious